I don't know. I just feel like there are so many other things that we could take into consideration than just pills when it comes down to pediatric obesity. I understand what the AAP is saying. However, being a hormone doctor, I, I just feel like maybe we should consider hormones and diet. And uh, sometimes the hormone thing has to do with the diet. And of course, going back to exercise, we've talked about the pediatric plan for possible pharmaceuticals helping with the obesity and surgery. But today, let's talk about the role that hormonal regulation and meal planning can play in addressing childhood obesity. My name is Tess Washington, MD, board certified physician and surgeon. And on this channel, we discuss various ways for you to optimize your looks, love, wealth, and health. More so now, we're focusing the channel on obesity, weight loss, exercise, and living a healthier life. If you're that kind of content, do me a favor, like, subscribe, share, go tell all your friends and snuggle on in because we're going to get into some content. Today, I really have a couple of papers I want to share with you that discuss hormonal regulation in childhood obesity. If I'm not your doctor, I'm not giving medical advice. Make sure that you follow any instructions that have been given to you by your board certified physician, nurse practitioner, DO, or whoever you may obtain your primary care from. We're talking about pediatric obesity. The American Academy of Pediatrics has put out their guidelines, but today let's focus on the consideration of hormones. This paper is a NIH paper that basically came out and it discusses screening for hormonal monogenic syndromic disorders in obese infants and children. And I feel like this topic really needs to be discussed because sometimes little fluffy kids, it's not necessarily their fault. It may be something that is genetic. It may be something that is being overlooked. There are a lot of uh, pediatric syndromes that may present with obesity, inability to lose weight, inability to exercise. Their musculoskeletal system is not as strong as some children in their age group. So the first thing that I would think before we start considering surgery or pharmaceuticals is why is this child obese? And why is this child having a hard time with weight loss? When I have adults to come in and they want to discuss their weight loss regimen, the first thing I will say is let's check your hormonal balance because we may not think that it is a big deal, but it really is a big deal. Just think. If we speak with regards to menstruating women, when a woman first starts her menses, that's a hormonal fluctuation. That's a hormonal change. If a woman gets pregnant during the time that that baby is being held within her uterus, that pregnancy is sustained by hormonal fluctuations. Once the woman has the child, we've all heard of postpartum depression. That also is a hormonal fluctuation. So you take a woman and she's had one period and if she's had three children and then she goes through menopause, that woman has had a minimum of four hormonal fluctuations. Do you not feel like her hormones have any kind of a role in her having a hard time losing weight or even mood swings or even her hair growth? It has a very significant role, but that's something that we don't consider. Now, let's talk about pediatrics and childhood obesity. If we haven't done a screening to rule out hormones, being an etiology or just a hormonal disorder by saying you're not losing weight, the little kid who's exactly your same age loses weight, you don't, so we're going to put you on medication and we haven't done a completely thorough workup. I think that we're doing that child more of a injustice than a justice. Let's look at this article. This article is from the Pediatric Endocrinology Fellow. And, and one thing I want to pause and state, um, integrative medicine doctors, functional medicine doctors, hormonal doctors, we go to the micro with regards to hormones. So we definitely respect our colleagues that are endocrinologists, but we definitely go to a deeper level. So even if you are being seen by an endocrinologist, allow us as functional medicine doctors to work 
as partners and collaborate on your overall hormonal regulation and care. Reading into this article, this article is basically dis- discussing the prevalence of pediatric obesity in the United States, quoting numbers that are much surpassed as this article is a little bit older. It's nearly 17%. Most cases are resulting from excess energy intake relative to energy expenditure. So basically, that's just simply saying that they're eating more food than they're exerting energy. And, and we already know that because like that was what we discussed in our previous couple of broadcasts. The poor little people, they're a lot more sedentary. They, they're just not as active now as they were previously over a prolonged period of time. However, some cases of obesity are endogenous, associated with hormonal, genetic, or syndromic disorders, such as hyper and hypothyroidism, Cushing syndrome, growth hormone deficiency, defective Lipton signaling. This this is so amazing. Guys, do you know how important Lipton signaling is? Now, you know, I could really take this video to the micro and, and, you know, share in the comments if you would like for me to. But I got to tell you, each one of these is a video within itself. Hypothyroidism and childhood obesity, Cushing syndrome. And some kids have these syndromes. And if we're not checking, how are we going to know? Growth hormone deficiency effective Lipton signaling, mutations in the melanchortin 4 receptors, and Prader-Willi. Oh my goodness, Prader-Willi? I have not heard that since like medical school. And those kids are just fluffy. They're just fluffy kids. And, And it has nothing to do with their diet. It has to do with a congenital syndrome that was possibly not detected. And that would just be so egregious if we just took a child with Prater Willie and just gave him surgery and we would totally be missing the mark. So basically the article just goes into reviewing hormonal monogenic and syndromic childhood obesity disorders and how to work them up how to distinguish exogenous versus endogenous etiologies for the childhood obesity. With that being said, I am quite sure the American Academy of Pediatrics would not recommend medication or surgery if they had not explored all avenues. But sometimes as parents, make sure you advocate for your little person And respectfully, hey, doc, I know you explored all avenues because you're a great doctor. We've been coming to you for years. But hey, can we check our little junior for hormonal irregulations or monogenic or any kind of a syndromic disorder that may be causing him to be fluffy? And I'm quite sure that your pediatrician would not mind exploring that avenue prior to the initiation of medication. The next thing I want to mention is meal plans. In my opinion, meal plans work for everyone in the home. We all should eat at a certain time. We should eat certain portions and there are certain things that we should eat on our plate. And it's not that food plate that we all grew up thinking was the right way to eat. The food plate has been turned upside down, sideways, it's been a triangle, it's been a square, it's been turned into all different kinds of dynamics. Basically what I do when it comes down to a diet is you first come in and I first meet you and we sit down and I get to know you. I get to know your environment. I get to know any kind of environmental pathogens. We check your body for heavy metals. We do a methylation detoxification. Then we look at your diet, your diet structure. But first we look at your caloric expenditure that you need for your life. Do you live an active life? Are you sedentary? What makes you tick? We have to take that into consideration because you need enough calories to live. After we work through all that, then we come up with a diet plan. As I've shared with you guys before, I use a diet plan from a registered dietitian that does everything 
evidence-based. Everything is fresh. Everything that you eat should be perishable because you don't want to put anything in your body that's going to just stay. And if you think about it, if we buy something off the shelf, how long has it been on that shelf? So what makes you think that once it goes from the shelf, it's going to go into your body and it's just going to be excreted? It's likely to stick around. So if we took a child and we put a child on a meal plan, that we more so bought the food from the outside of the grocery store. You guys know that whole thing. Shop more on the outskirts of the grocery store than on the inside of the grocery store. And children are... They, they will mold. They'll be like, okay. And especially if you have a little boy and if he sees daddy doing it, and if you have a little girl and if she sees mommy doing it, because all children idolize their parents and they want to be like their parents. So let's look at this article that I found that discussed some of the positive ways of dealing with childhood obesity by simply implementing meal plans. This article just goes into some of the healthy ways that we can change our kids' behavior into eating healthy. How can I tell if my child is overweight? You know, some parents, if they're a little bit fluffy, they feel like, well, it looks good to me. Someone stated in our TikTok, well, don't children need that extra fat because they're growing and Yes, most kids do need that fat for exercise. If we look at fat, when we exercise, the first thing that we burn is our carbohydrates. And then once we burn the carbohydrates, it takes about 30 minutes before we start to actually burn fat. Now, if you take a child who used to go outside and exercise the way that we used to exercise, those kids would be out there digging and getting dirty and playing around absolutely they would exercise long enough where they finally do get down to burning the fat but do kids really exercise at that level nowadays and that goes back to what the first article was saying that kids retain more energy than they burn but overall speaking Kids right now are not quite exercising enough to really get down to burning fat. So that's the main reason why we kind of actually, we don't want to restrict their caloric intake, but we want to make the, make the calories count. In other words, you could eat a small meal that has a whole lot of bang for its buck than to eat a whole big meal that really, it, it hasn't really done anything for you we need to go into glycemic index we need to go into you are what you eat and why that saying was initiated and how that saying really is important and how that saying is really relative when it comes down to kids I think that so the things that would really just break this whole childhood obesity out the water and discard it would be a change in diet, a change in exercise, an evaluation of their hormones to make sure that there's nothing that we're missing. After we have done all of those things, then I think that we should consider pharmaceuticals and surgical intervention per the AAP guidelines. But I think that if we did those first three, diet, exercise, and check the hormones to make sure that there's nothing we're missing as far as the syndrome disorder, we may not even get to the latter two, which are pharmaceuticals and surgical intervention. If parents started to just flex their lifestyle a little bit and help the little children with their obesity, I promise you, cross my heart, pinky swear, it will help you too, and you'll see positive change. Let's wrap this all up. Pharmaceuticals and surgery for childhood obesity. So say American Academy of Pediatrics. But if you ask Dr. Tess, I think that we need to put three things in front of those two. Check the child's hormones. Check your hormones. Get on a meal plan and get on a regular exercise regimen and 
exercise to the point that you are going past the carbohydrates and that you are burning fat. This is not medical advice. Make sure you speak to your healthcare provider before you follow anything. I am licensed to take on patients in Illinois, Indiana, Montana, New York, Nevada, and California. I will have resources below of some dietary recommendations, some meal plans, and some suggestions as far as checking childhood hormonal levels in the description box at the bottom of this video. I'm still trying to figure out how to get on YouTube daily and maintain my hospital schedule. And until then, I'm going to put forth the effort that I can to come on as frequently as I can. I'm Dr. Tess. Thank you so much for stopping by TessMDTV. Hi. See you tomorrow.